Welcome to The Lead, the New Lines Magazine podcast. I'm Joshua Martin, and this is a podcast where we delve into the biggest ideas, events, and personalities from around the world. If you were to compile a list of the most influential figures in modern Middle Eastern history, Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser would invariably be in or near the top spot. A member of the Free Officers Movement who overthrew King Farouk in 1952's military coup, Nasser moved quickly to take control of the junta. As head of state, he became hugely popular across the Arab world for his confrontational approach to the region's former colonial overlords, his resolute pan-Arabism, and his nimble Cold War diplomacy. But Nasser's story has a much bloodier side. His authoritarian government moved quickly to forcefully suppress all opposition at home and abroad, and many argue that his aggressive foreign policy prepared the stage for many of the region's worst wars and most brutal dictatorships. I'm joined today by New Line's very own Alex Rao, whose new book, We Are Your Soldiers, How Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser Remade the Arab World, was published at the end of last year. Branded Essential Reading by Cambridge historian and friend of the podcast Eugene Rogan, the book examines the legacy of its iconic lead character. Crushing democracy at home while launching wars and slaying opponents abroad, the book's dust jacket reads, Nasser ushered in the long political winter from which the region is still to emerge. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. So, Alex, since this book is quite a radical reinterpretation of Nasser and his legacy, I wanted to start actually by asking you about the more conventional views. What are the traditional narratives about Nasser and what do you think they get wrong? Well, I get, you know, from the very beginning, he has obviously divided opinion between uh, ardent admirers and mortal foes. Conventionally, if you want to take the kind of 20th century paradigms, you have his admirers who say this was a a sort of plucky national liberator who slew the dragon of Western empire and ushered in the period of decolonization and what was then called third world uh, liberation. The term obviously was not, didn't have the pejorative associations at the time that it now has acquired. Whereas his, uh, his opponents, his critics would have said he was a kind of Soviet stooge who handed Moscow the keys to the Middle East and, of course, was a, an authoritarian, uh, a bloody figure and, and things like that. Uh, those views, in many ways, do still kind of prevail. And he is still a, a man who divides opinion uh, very, very vehemently. And part of the reason I wrote this book was to try and move beyond both of those views, whatever their respective merits and demerits may be, and take a look at the man and the people who actually he ruled over, both in Egypt and uh, in the wider region, who have so often been left out of both of those kind of uh, grand Cold War geopolitics chess match uh, narratives. So why did you feel the time was right for such a radical reinterpretation now? I think uh, one of the key sort of bits of background context was obviously the Arab Spring, which... It's very uh, much post-Arab Spring work. I th- I, yeah, I think it has to be, inevitably. Uh, I mean, you know, there was there was probably a strong case for a reassessment of Nasser anyway before 2011, uh, but it was all the more necessary and all the more obvious to me that this was something that someone had to write um, in, in the wake of that seismic revolt, precisely because if you, if you just take a, a moment to look at the Arab Spring and the... the the countries in which the largest protests occurred and the regimes against which millions so courageously rose up and uh, revolted against, they were precisely the regimes that were the most direct legacies of Nasser's time in power, starting most obviously with Egypt, but also uh, regimes like Gaddafi in Libya, Assad in Mm. Syria, uh, Saleh in Yemen, and and others. These were were precisely the regimes that were most products of, of the Nasser era, in a way that, for example, I don't know, you know, uh, the UAE is, is less so. Actually, I think Nasser's quite an interesting comparison with a lot of those figures, though, because someone like Gaddafi, for instance, who you mentioned, and consciously styled himself after Nasser, I mean, he was quite flagrantly, at the end of the day, he was quite flagrantly a self-interested autocrat. Whereas I kind of get the impression from a lot of accounts of Nasser, even relatively unsympathetic ones like this one, that he was a true believer. You know, he did think that what he was doing was what was necessary. Potentially. Um, but before even being able to answer that, we have to we have to ask, what did he believe in? And that is something that still has never been entirely clear to me, or I think to anyone else, uh, least of all Nasser himself. If we just look at the kind of ideological level, uh, it, th- it's, it's very incoherent, and he himself is kind of... There's a constant process of improvisation, I feel, with Nasser in terms of ideology. 
what does he and his so-called revolution stand for, uh, the answer keeps changing. In the beginning, he and the free officers are a kind of Egyptian nationalist movement, what you might call Egypt first. All of their aims, their self-proclaimed aims in the, in the coup d'etat that they later styled a revolution, were, were wholly domestic in scope. There was no, no talk of even Arab unity, even in a kind of vague poetic way. It, all the, the six stated objectives of their uh, coup in 1952 were entirely Egyptian uh, in scope. Then around the mid-1950s, he moves towards this kind of pan-Arab nationalism that, of course, became so associated with his name. But that kind of fizzles out around uh, 1961 with the collapse of the Egypt's union with Syria, and they kind of just uh, quietly dust that under the carpet, and it, Arab socialism becomes the new state doctrine. And even that runs its course, of course, runs into the ground, really, with the, the humiliating defeat of 1967, at which point there isn't even anything left to fill the gap and the regime is just kind of plodding along aimlessly and without any real uh, driving ideology, which you could argue is, has basically remained the case in Egypt to this day. I mean, what does CC stand for ideologically? It's very hard to pin down anything concrete. And he's, yeah, he's, absolutely. He's, he's very much like Nasser in that respect, I think. So what do you make then of those sort of shifts in ideology? What do you think was behind them? Well, as I say, I, I believe it was a, a, a constant process of improvisation. They, they pulled off the coup, perhaps with more success than they even uh, dared imagine they would do, and then they were just thrust into power, and it was, OK, what are we going to do with this? And so you know, they, they did uh, enact their kind of uh, relatively modest, or you might say ambitious, domestic program, things like agrarian reform, various reforms to education and so on. But uh, th that wasn't quite doing it. And then by the mid-1950s, you had Britain exiting the stage with the conclusion of a, of a treaty in 1954 between Egypt and Britain that saw uh, Britain was going to pull out its remaining troops from Egypt within a period of, I think it was 20 months, roughly two years. And then the, the Brits started to come up with this idea of a Baghdad pact, so-called, uh, as a, because they could clearly see that their empire was crumbling, not just in the Middle East, but the, the whole world over. They had to come up with something to... Uh, to rectify the situation as, as they would see it. The Baghdad Pact was one of these schemes that they came up with where you would link Europe via Turkey all the way to uh, Asia via Pakistan in this kind of unbroken chain of, of British allies. So Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, going all the way to the gates of China. And this was, I mean, this was sold as a kind of anti-Soviet measure. And sure enough, it would kind of hem in the Soviet Union in one respect. But it was essentially a a way of cementing British influence in, uh, in, in the Middle East and, and indeed beyond. Nasser then found it expedient and, and may well have also believed earnestly and genuinely uh, that this was, a, this was a bad thing that had to be opposed. And this really marked his entrance onto the kind of pan-Arab regional stage when he was, began to vie for leadership, as it were, of, of not just Egypt, but the Arab world as a whole. And he got into his famous battles with the Prime Minister of Iraq, most notably at the time, Nouri Said, a man who is almost forgotten now to history. It's, it's hard to believe nowadays that the main regional rivalry was actually not Saudi Arabia and Iran, or, or, or even Egypt and Saudi Arabia, but Egypt and Iraq. Uh, and that, that was really what got him into the kind of uh, the pan-Arab mode. And then, as I said, it was that reached its summit, if you like, in 1958, with the union with Syria, concluded in February 1958, that was followed very quickly by the big coup in Iraq in July 1958. The same year, there was also a, a summer of bloodshed in Lebanon that same year. Uh, it's gone down in Lebanese history as the summer of blood, and Nasser was deeply embroiled and involved uh, in that as well. All these events happening in very rapid succession in 1958 that made him seem this kind of, uh, you know, really mess messianic demigod figure. And this, of course, is also coming on the heels of the Suez nationalization of 56, which which is, is really, in, in a way, the kind of backdrop to all of that. But then that crumbles, like I said, in 61. Uh, all of a sudden, he has to come up with, you know, he's a man who always has to be improvising the next big thing, the next grand ideology that is going to justify why I have essentially suspended democracy in this country that used to have a version of democracy, a deeply flawed and corrupt one, you may say, but, you know, there was a parliament, there was there were multiple parties of different persuasions from the far left to the Muslim Brotherhood to the kind of ultra-nationalist right. And 
in between this sort of liberal, centrist, capitalist, waft party that was actually the most popular party in Egypt at the time, all of that got steamrolled. And for what? You, know, you do have to justify that to people, even if you are a, a very popular autocrat. At the same time, there has to be a narrative that you can sell. So do you think then the difference between Nasser and um, you know, his successes in the region might be that he was better at selling that narrative? Well, he was for a time, until he wasn't, of course. I mean, already by the time of his death in 1970, he had become uh, increasingly unpopular, even, I mean, almost, you might say especially at home in Egypt. It's very interesting if you look at the literature in the mid-1960s in Egypt, and I did sort of, you know, I highlighted a few novels uh, and writers, people like Naguib Mahfouz, the famous Nobel Prize laureate, but also uh, Sanala Ibrahim, another prominent Egyptian novelist, the playwright Tofik al-Hakim, many others. Uh, something begins to happen around the mid-1960s where you start to see this very sort of dark, these dark themes emerging in, in Egyptian novels that were very much at odds with the, the socialist utopia that regime pr propaganda was obviously keen to, to promote. You start to see a country where the promise of the revolution has clearly not been realised, the, the promise of liberation and freedom that had had appeared genuine, perhaps, to, to millions in, in the early to mid-1950s, had ended up in economic misery. I mean, you know, the economy in Egypt was, was in very poor shape in, by the mid-1960s. Uh, you know, the political, uh, the political scene had just become a wasteland of total uh, repression, really much more repressive than almost any regime that came after him in Egypt. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think even even within his lifetime, he had begun to, to lose a lot of popularity. You were talking about uh, themes in Egyptian literature there. And I think that's probably a, quite a good moment to sort of address the elephant in the recording room here. And that's that, you know, we're both talking with a British accent. And obviously a lot of negative writing about Nasser has come from British people who haven't been able to get over the Suez crisis, basically. Um, so it's probably reasonable for people to hear two British accents and be a little bit wary. But actually, that couldn't be further from, from what you set out to do here, really. You are very specifically focused on, you know, the Arab experience of Nasser and almost intentionally have cut out the sort of wider international aspects to it, because that's not what you wanted to focus on, right? Very much so, yeah. And of course, one, one is uh, always mindful of the possibility of that critique. Oh, yeah, here comes another white uh, British guy uh, still pissed off about Anthony Eden or something. No, this yes. <laughs> the book is in, in absolutely no way intended as a defense of Anthony Eden or of the Suez War, which was uh, not just misguided and strategically, uh, you know, an act of lunacy, but certainly immoral and just a complete calamity, whichever way you look at it. No, on the contrary, as you as you kindly alluded to, all of the criticism in the book is based on that which has already been advanced by Egyptians and other Arabs themselves. I mean, the, the book would not could not exist without those critiques. Um, you know, just I mentioned Tofik al Hakim earlier. He was essentially the the, the father of Egyptian theatre. He wrote a, a celebrated book shortly after Nasser's death, uh, which advanced a lot of a lot of the critiques that lay, basically laid a lot of the foundations of the later critiques of Nasserism. And there are so many. Louis Awad was another one of the time. Uh, the great socialist Anwar Abdel Malik, he, he wrote an excellent book. Uh, and also Sanal al Ibrahim, the, the novelist I mentioned, wrote an account of his time in prison. You know, one of the great stories that I hadn't really appreciated before researching this book was just the, the extent and violence of Nasser's persecution of the Egyptian left. It really is quite stunning. Mm. And it's, it's, I devote a whole chapter to this. There was a, a camp outside of Cairo called Abu Zabal. Uh, it actually pre predated his time. It went back to, to Ottoman times, I believe. And this was where he chose in 1959, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, to uh, basically there was, there was a total crackdown on the communists in Egypt and later also uh, Syria and Iraq and, and elsewhere. And they were locked in camps. And there was a very, there are several memoirs of, by people who, survived these camps and came out uh, and later wrote books about them. But one in particular that I, that I depended on, which I, was very hard to track down, actually. I had to go to Cairo and the publisher, who, which still exists, uh, Dar al-Thaqaf al-Gadida. It was out of print, but the, the man in, in the publisher was very kindly offered to do me a one-off uh, 
reprint of this book from, from some time in the wow. 1970s. So, yeah, that, that was a tough one to get hold of. Even the American University of Beirut Library, which has everything, uh, didn't have that book. And that was a really priceless uh, account, a first-hand account of surviving the torture in Abu Zabal at the time, which, by the way, a lot of the same, the very same rituals and uh, customs of the torture are still used to this day in Egyptian prisons. Most most famously, something called the Tashrifa, or uh, as they sort of ironically call it, the, the welcoming ceremony. When you first arrive at, at prison in Egypt, now you get stripped. At, now, as then, you, you're stripped naked and made to run through a parallel row of soldiers who are just beating you with whatever they can get their hands on, really, uh, cudgels and batons and so on. Uh, and it's a form of, well, that's the welcoming ceremony, that's your initiation, as it were. Uh, and that still goes on to this day. You use a very good phrase in the book to describe it. You call it a long political winter. And your contention is basically that Nasser ushered in this long political winter and the Arab Spring was an attempt to overturn it. So could you talk a bit more about that? What did the sort of process of ushering in this period look like? How did Nasser bring that about? Uh, I mean, it was quite straightforward, really. They just totally steamrolled the old order. So, you know, maybe it helps to go back to the to the very beginning. They undertook their military coup on 23rd July 1952. Uh, and the king was gone three days later. King Farouk set sail to Naples uh, on, on the royal yacht, which then went back and, and w was continued to be used by Egyptian presidents for, for decades afterwards. And over the course of the coming months, really the first two years, it took them about two years, they, as I say, just steamrolled the old order. So banned all political parties, jailed the sort of most prominent figures of those parties and subjected them to show trials and so on, which, of course, uh, may, you know, may have been merited in some extent, but also relied on all kinds of dubious, uh, not to say ludicrous, evidence. And these were sort of kangaroo courts where the, the, the officers themselves were the presiding judges. And Parliament was shut down. It was essentially, you know, completely ruled by military junta, as you say. And the press was gutted, the judiciary uh, muzzled. Students were cracked down on. The, the state apparatus itself was purged and you had officers just infiltrating every aspect of the state. So, you know, for example, the, the journalist union, which had always been presided over by an actual journalist, suddenly got one of the free officers. Um, universities were no longer able to choose who they hired. It was an officer suddenly. A, a committee would be created and an officer. So they you know, really just totally sank their teeth into all aspects of the state. And yeah, by about 19, by 1954, there was that, this actually sparked a, a very big uprising, very big by, by the standards of the time, in March 1954, which I think is a really key episode that, again, I had not been aware of before researching the story, but I I thought it very important to emphasize this because it has a kind of parallel with, with the 2011 uprising, I, I thought. Um, it Very, very briefly, it was this process had, had been, that I've just been describing had been going on and had increasingly alienated, as you might imagine, just every you know political force in Egypt from the left to the right and all in between. Matters came to a head in March 1954 with essentially a kind of national uprising. Uh, very akin in a way, although on, on a perhaps a slightly smaller scale to what happened in 2011. So communists, feminists, intellectuals, lawyers, academics, Muslim brothers, yes, were also definitely prominent on the ground. Street protests and everything calling for an end to this and calling for a restoration of democracy. Um, goes to show you, by the way, just how sophisticated and rich political life actually had been in Egypt in the 1950s. You know, um, right. Which is, is just something that you would not really know today unless you went back and, and dove into the history. And the same applied, by the way, in Syria, in, in so many other countries. Even in Jordan, there were, there were very free parliamentary elections, believe it or not, in the 1950s. This was a time that had so much potential, so much promise, had it not been for these military dictators who then sprung up and, and crushed it all. Yeah, so that actually gets me to my next question, which was that Fawaz Gurdjieff, uh, writing in the Financial Times, um, had a more critical take on your book than most reviewers have. And he basically argues that you ascribe too much agency to Nasser, remarking that, quote, Nasser was a creature of his turbulent times, and for all his charismatic presence, was at the mercy of greater forces that he could not control, 
So he basically suggests that what you identify as NASA's legacy was actually the product of the same structural historical forces that the man himself was buffeted by. And I wondered what you made of that. Yeah, I mean, of course, I read the review um, and should say, you know, first of all, uh, Dr. Professor Georges is a man I respect and I depended in, to a large extent on his own book on NASA in writing my research. Uh, so he's, he certainly knows the subject very well and is a man whose critique is to be taken seriously. But at the same time, I didn't feel very persuaded by the arguments he was making in that uh, in that particular review. First of all, you, you phrased it interestingly, and it is odd to be critiqued for ascribing too much agency to, to an Arab leader rather than the reverse. But, you know, really, the kind of the thrust of his critique, as I understood it, was that this was all somehow America's fault. Um, that's to simplify it slightly. But the, the idea that, you know, America was playing these Cold War, these shady, shifty Cold War games, and NASA was simply a well-intentioned third world sort of, you know, national liberator who was contending with these forces that were more powerful than he could bear. And so he, that somehow compelled him to, you know, gas women and children in Yemen or blow up the prime minister in Jordan in 1960 or uh, assassinate a journalist in Beirut. You know, I just, I don't see the link. Uh, this is really, this. it's just the same species of argument that we hear today about someone like Bashar al-Assad that, oh, you know, America uh, is, I don't know, sanctioning Syria, therefore this is why Bashar has to be a, a, a totalitarian dictator. It's also doubly wrong in Nasser's particular case because Nasser was, in fact, on very good terms with America for certainly throughout the 1950s, well into the 1960s, and even at the very end, I mean, you know, at the very sort of twilight of his career, he, he accepted the Rogers Plan, which was the kind of Middle East two-state solution peace plan of the day. Yes, he did go through a rough sort of five-ish years in the mid-1960s, particularly after the assassination of JFK, when Lyndon Johnson came to power and they really sort of fell out and this was uh, the height of the Yemen war. There was also disputes going on as, in fields as far away as, as Congo. So yeah, we can't say that Nasser was, uh, he, he wasn't what Sadat became to America, certainly. But funnily enough, if you read the communist critiques and the Muslim Brotherhood critiques of Nasser, particularly in the 1950s, it's all about him being uh, an American agent and his you know, the, drawing attention to his cl very close and, and, and friendly ties with the US ambassador at the time. And they were always at the embassy having dinner even with the ambassador. So the critique that, that American hostility is to blame for Nasser's uh, excesses, I, I don't think it stands up at all. British hostility. I mean, because I'm, I'm glad you sort of talked about that a bit, because that is, I think, one of the defences I see the most of NASA, is that um, given the perilous situation Egypt was in, the perilous global situation, these kinds of, shall we say, decisive action abroad uh, and at home was necessary to hold the country together. And it, it doesn't it does occur to me that this is quite similar to what Americans would say about the uh, fight against communism. But, I mean, do you have any sympathy with that argument at all, that, you know, some of this was the result of trying to preserve Egypt's independence, fight off foreign powers like France, Britain or Israel? Or do you think that that's all sort of post hoc? No, well, clearly the, the Suez War of 1956 shows that the threat from these uh, these countries was 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 undoubtedly real. I mean, we can't uh, just scrub out the, the Suez War from history. Britain did, in that sense, at least under Antony Eden at that particular point in time, pose a, a very clear danger to to Egypt. But but you still have to go an extra distance and explain why that forced him to commit all the acts I just mentioned, you know, killing a, a prime minister yes. in Jordan and fomenting war in Lebanon. Um, so, yeah, and th that is, again, why I focused on these particular darker sides of Nasser's um, legacy in the book, because the, this, the other side of the story, the Cold War geopolitics, has really been done to death, and nobody I mean, that I could see, or very little, had been written, particularly in English, about all these other things, which in, in many ways are kind of the more enduring legacy, I feel, particularly in light of things like the Arab Spring. You know, the Cold War is now long behind us, although some would say the Cold War is coming back and everything. That's a separate <laughs> separate question. But 
What has remained is the authoritarian police state, the lack of press freedom, the la lack of all kinds of personal and civil liberties, uh, the torture, the wars, the assassinations. Those are the things that still plague the region to this day. So why then do you think that Nasser does remain so popular among so many in the Arab world? Obviously, he's a very polarizing figure, but he does still have a following, and I think more than many of these other um, authoritarian figures um, from around the same sort of time. So what do you think that is behind that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And it is funny how, how often there is an exception made of Nasser. Even, you know, you talk to a lot of people who will freely concede that they're all terrible. Gaddafi, Assad, Saddam, you know, all awful. But Nasser, you know, eh, he's a bit different. Come on, he, we, we like that guy. Mm. Um, you know, you'd, you'd really have to, uh, have to ask his, his defenders. But I suppose in part, one of the answers is he's very charismatic. There's absolutely no denying that. He's a spellbinding orator, a brilliant speaker. You know, he, he has a stand-up comedian's timing. There's this famous clip that many people will be aware of from late 1965, where he's, he's sort of mocking the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, but it's actually a very sinister subtext, by the way, because it comes at a time when he's cracking down on hugely on the Muslim Brotherhood, and he's just about to execute yes. Said Qutb. But uh, if we ignore all that, it's, it's quite amusing, because he, he tells this story of meeting with the the supreme guide of the Muslim Brotherhood, who, who tells him, you know, you're, you're now the president of Egypt, you have to make all the women wear a hijab, or a tarha, uh, he calls it. And he tells him, you have a daughter in the engineering college or something. He goes, yes, she's not wearing one. You can't even make your own daughter. I mean, I can't even begin to impersonate. He tells it so much better than I obviously could do. But the whole room is just roaring with laughter. And yeah, I mean, it is very, very funny. Again, if you if you ignore what, what, the, what the subtext of it actually is. So yeah, there, there's definitely a huge charisma element. There's also a very important point, which is actually relevant for, for the whole discussion, which is that he is the first great in inverted commas, post-colonial leader of the Arab world. That, that should never be yes. forgotten, and that is really crucial. You know, before, before Nasser, uh, it's all just European colonialism, and before that, Ottoman, and going back into sort of the medieval times. He is really the first uh, great figure of his, of his era, and that allows him to set the tone, to set the paradigm for the decades to come. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is that he chooses to do so in an authoritarian manner. Whereas, you know, you could easily argue he had alternatives. Look at a country like India, in many ways, very similar circumstances, attains its independence from Britain around the same time, had also suffered horrendous violence from British colonialism, mm. but chooses to establish a parliamentary democracy. Uh, okay, in, in recent years, we've seen that that democracy has become frayed and there's all kinds of problems with it, but it remains arguably on paper, at least the world's largest democracy. Uh, and, you know, you could argue is in a healthier shape than much of the Arab world today. So then how much do you think uh, Nasser's legacy, uh, coming from that, is being reevaluated in the wake of the Arab Spring? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been very encouraging to see particularly younger Egyptians and other Arabs uh, taking on that process just spontaneously. I mean, you see it even online, on social media, in kind of memes and, and you know, things as, as sort of trifling as that, but they're important in a way. Um, you know, you see all these kind of, uh, again, memes and, and comic images of him where he's portrayed as this kind of paragon of, of failure and calamity in a way that he certainly wouldn't have been any, at any time, really before the Arab Spring. So I think the general kind of iconoclastic spirit that the, that the Arab Spring uncorked has definitely forced a new generation of people to question not just again, the likes of Assad and Saddam, but even this most hallowed of heroes, uh, uh, Abdel Nasser, in a way that is obviously very encouraging and I would say very healthy. At the same time, one could always uh, wish for that to go further. One of the things that has been more lacking, I guess, is, is extending that into book-length treatments and serious kind of works of scholarship and analysis. I mean, with very honourable exceptions. There is, for instance, the Professor Sharif Yunus at Helwan University, probably the world's foremost authority on Nasser and Nasserist ideology. He has written some incredibly important books, but he's the exception that proves the rule in a way. Uh, there's an Egyptian journalist, Khaled Mansour, who made a, a good observation recently where he said that 
he, he is not aware of a single critical biography of Abdel Nasser written in Arabic, which is quite striking. I mean, if you imagine, yes, we have our, our fair share of hagiographies of Churchill, for instance, in, in the English-speaking world, but we do at least have some critical uh, works on, on the man. So for a figure as huge as Nasser, for there not to be a single critical biography is, um, you know, is something that one, one would hope will change in the near future. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting what you're saying about it being particularly online and particularly among young people that the sort of reevaluation is happening, almost as if scholarship is a little behind the culture. And the reason that's really interesting is because actually I think that's that's not just a Middle Eastern phenomenon where, you know, all the old I idols and icons are being sort of questioned and reinterpreted and what not by young people online. I mean, it seems to be a bit of a global moment. Yeah. And there are other obstacles as well to what, you know, to more traditional kinds of scholarship, which is that it's not as if the Egyptian national or presidential archive is open for you to go in and just read. These, these things yes. are, are closed black boxes. Um, one of the things that I was fortunate to benefit from with this book was the recent completion, I mean, it's 20, 2008, I think it was, but recent in, in Nasser's terms, of this um, this painstaking research conducted actually by Nasser's daughter, Dr. Huda Abdel Nasser, who has transcribed over 1,300 of his speeches verbatim, you know, letter for letter, and made them all freely accessible on the website of the Library of Alexandria. So that was something that wasn't available to those writing about Nasser at least before 2008. So if, I mean, naturally I... I depended very much on on those for for the research and for quotations and often correcting what were misquotations in in older books. Um, but you know, aside from that, there is there is unfortunately very little in the way of official archives. So you know, there, there isn't. You're, you're rather limited, really, in in what uh, in, in what academics can do. In that sense, at mm. least. I also wonder whether you know this this moment. Um, where, like you say, we're sort of due uh, reinterpretation of Nasser's legacy, particularly in the wake of the Arab Spring. I, I wonder if we're sort of getting to the end of that moment, because oh, for the past decade or so, the big atrocities coming out of the Middle East were being committed by people against people by their own governments. Whereas now, since the October 7th attacks and the Israeli invasion of Gaza and the potential of that conflict escalating to a wider regional war. And again, the enemy sort of becoming something foreign from another coming from outside. Do you think we might see a new generation of Nasserish figures emerging in its wake? That's a very interesting suggestion. And I do agree that the kind of uh, zeitgeist does appear to have shifted. It's almost as though the Arab Spring moment has has passed in a way as as you're saying yes and but at the same time the underlying factors that drove and caused the Arab Spring have not gone anywhere you know the the, the regimes are still as bad as they were if not worse frankly than it, on on the at the on the eve of the Arab Spring so yeah. we can choose to ignore it if we like and we can as you say you know we can very much uh, get involved in other issues obviously the Israel Palestine dispute is now front and center also the uh, the Iranian sort of uh, dispute with, with with the U.S. These are all very big questions that are not directly related to to NASA. But but sooner or later we're going to be forced to return to these same questions because the causes of the Arab Spring remain in place, which means that it is always liable to 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 return. And again, you know, you go to a look at a place like Syria, southern Syria, uh, the Sueda province. You'd hardly know it reading the Western media these days, but there have been protests in the city of Sueda in southern Syria for several months now. Every single Friday, they're out and raising the same slogans. The people want the fall of the regime, uh, you know, as, as though it were still 2011. So I don't think, even if you're, you're absolutely right to suggest that attention is elsewhere today, I don't think we're remotely out of the woods in terms of, oh, the Arab Spring uh, has come and gone and, and you know, that, that's now ancient history. Uh, so when we had Eugene Rogan on the show, we committed what is a great sin, actually, in the eyes of many historians, uh, because we asked him what he thought might have been different about the world had the Ottoman Empire survived. And uh, if you're OK with this, I'd like to commit much the same sin today before we wrap up and ask you what you think the Middle East... A counterfactual, exactly. 
and ask you what you think the Middle East might look like today had NASA ever never taken power. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, with with the caveat that these are, this is always a fool's uh, game. It's yeah. It's it's very hard to say. Of course. I mean, it, it's easy to imagine a far brighter future where parliamentary democracy would have remained and, and indeed flourished, and we would have just you know wonderful pluralistic liberal societies. Um, it's also very easy to imagine things going in the opposite direction. I mean, take a, a country like Lebanon, Lebanon <clears throat> I suppose, which does still have a parliamentary democracy on paper and did preserve much in the way of personal freedoms, at least compared to a, a, a state like Egypt, still did not exactly save it uh, from 15 years of civil war and all kinds of profound difficulties and, and problems that it faces today, which incidentally one could argue are in, in large part the fault of NASA, uh, as, as I do in the book. So yeah, it's, uh, no, I, I'm afraid I, I'm going to have to be boring and, and, and duck out from giving it anything definitive or bold in my, in my answer there. Uh, I certainly think that it would have been better. How much better? Uh, yeah, I'm not prepared to, to stake a bet. Thanks, Raoul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. This has been The Lead, a podcast by New Lines magazine. You can find Alex on Twitter at Alex J. Raoul and find his book, We Are Your Soldiers, at all good bookshops. This week's episode was hosted by Joshua Martin and produced by Finbar Anderson. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favourite podcast app or visit our website, newlinesmag.com. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>